All right. Good morning. How's everybody today? Looks like we have the same usual group. Um, we are, I wonder if everybody else has kind of dropped out of the course. I know there's one that said she's just going to take it. Two actually said they were going to do it online. All right. So you ready? Let's start. Chapter 12 today is the financing chapter. This is probably one of the longest chapters in the book, these next two. So we'll cover them and hopefully we can get through it in a good amount of time. So on chapter 12, we're gonna talk about financing. If you can understand financing for your client, this is probably one of the best ways to keep a client. Obviously, other than knowing the real estate world, Financing is always a confusion and it seems like a black box to a lot of people. All they know is they call this person, tell them a bunch of numbers, and three days later, this person calls back and says, yes, I can get you approved, all right? So if you can understand it and explain it to your client, you will become a very valuable asset throughout this process, even when you turn them over to the mortgage broker or the banker, all right? So there on page 208, we're gonna talk a little bit about affordability. Only about 70% of the population actually owns a house, all right? Most, or the others, are renters. Believe it or not, part of your job may be to tell a client, you're not a buyer, all right? You're not a buyer. And there's nothing wrong with this. You actually want to let them know I'm going to save you some time and me some time because you don't qualify. And I'm certainly, I love to look at houses, but I don't want to waste four hours of my time showing property to a person who's not going to qualify. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, the hard truth sometimes is the best truth. So part of your job may be to pre-qualify a person when they call you and go, hey, I want to buy a house. You ask them four or five questions. And they go, oh, I really want to buy this Michael Duke house. It's $900,000. And I work at Walmart as a greeter making seven fifty. dollars Time out. You ain't going to qualify for that. I just saved you some time and me some time. All right? So part of your job may literally be not helping a buyer buy. All right? So understand that. Now, in the mortgage world, they have terms just like we have terms that you need to understand. The first term that they use is going to be this one that I'm sure you heard before, if I can find my notes. We've talked a little bit about this. The first one I wanna talk about is called a pity payment. It's a pity you have to make it, all right? That stands for principal and interest and then these two terms here, taxes and insurance. And that's homeowner's insurance, all right? So those are the, that's one of the terms we're gonna talk about, it's a pity payment. It's a pity you have to make it. If someone says they are making a pity payment, it includes those two, Parts. Have you heard of this word and we've talked about it before? When someone says their payments are escrowed, that means they are in fact making part of their payments as a pity payment. And two of those, the real estate taxes and the insurance, and that is homeowner's insurance, are actually being placed inside of an escrow so that when the real estate taxes come due or the homeowner's insurance comes due, there is actually money available to make that payment. And we've talked a little bit about that in a previous chapter. We're gonna to touch on it some more today as well. So it's called the pity payment, all right? Now, one thing I found out yesterday is that while I'm sharing my screen, you guys actually still get to see my camera. 
So I'm glad I found that out so I wasn't like picking my nose or something during the screen version thinking, oh, it's not getting recorded and you guys can still see me. <clears throat> so on page 209, when a client goes to buy property, there are going to be three things that they will check or the lender will check to make sure a person is qualifiable for a, a mortgage. The first one they're going to check is obviously the person themselves. What's the best way to determine if a client is eligible or not? Anybody have any ideas? What's the best way to determine if a client is eligible to get a loan when dealing with the person? The most common thing they check is what? Credit. Credit score, exactly. All right, so credit score, there are three companies that determine your credit score. Experian, TransUnion, and Equifax. These are the three credit companies that rate you on a score. This score ranks from 300 to about 900 ish all right they use this thing called the fico method fico stands for fair isaac's company you guys don't really need to know that but each company then uses this mathematical model to kind of tweak your credit score so the average person will have three credit scores all right uh, let me make sure I can do this. So when you see someone's credit score, they may say, oh, it's a 640. One of them is a 670 and the other is a 690. All of them are going to be roughly close to being the same because they're using the same mathematical model. They just tweak it a little bit for their preference. When a person qualifies for a loan, the lender or the mortgage broker will pull all three of these credit scores, and that is called a tri-merge. Tri meaning three, all three of them. And when they look at these three, they will always use the middle score, not the average, not any other number, they would use the middle score. So in this particular case, this person would have a credit score of 670 that the lender would use to estimate this person's ability to repay the loan, all right? Now, if they have a husband and wife qualifying, here's the problem. This is one spouse. Let's say the other spouse comes in like this. In this particular case, their credit score is 540. If two couples or two people qualify, guess which one of these they actually use? They use the lower of the two. So in this particular case, you've got one spouse with a 670, one spouse with a 540. They would base their ability to repay on the 540 credit score. Now, seems kind of funny to me because basically what they're saying is that the bad person is going to influence the good person more than the good person influencing the bad person uh, and helping them bring the credit score up. So there will be cases when you see this happen where your lender is gonna go, you know what? We can't use the spouse, so it's only going to be in one person's name. This is why you see this when you see a lot of married couples and they go, well, the, the house is in my name, or they'll say that because one of the spouse's credit scores may not be eligible to get financed. Funny story, when my wife and I bought her car when we first got married nine years ago, we went in and the guy said, is this gonna be in both your names? And we said, yeah. So he goes back and he comes out and he's laughing. He's like, I've never seen this before. 
And he points to my wife and goes, you have an 820 credit score. And he said, that's really good. And he looked at me and goes, you don't have a score. I'm like, yeah, no, I don't. Because I hadn't used credit since 1999. I've been buying everything on cash. So I actually had no credit score. That's as bad as having bad credit, believe it or not. So I had to go through some processes to build my credit up and I did that whole thing. And now it's at about a 704 and my wife's is like an 810, all right? So he's like, I, I can't put you both on the car. I'm like, that's cool. But we were married, so guess what? I owned half of it anyway under the dower and curtsy stuff, all right?